Good morning. Welcome to the study of the Word of God with Spring Valley Bible Church. I'm Chris Dagg, standing in for our faithful teacher, Herman Maddox. Uh, please be in prayer for Herman and Judith as uh, Pastor Maddox recovers from some health issues. Uh, constant prayer for the Maddox family, if you would please. That's uh, He's a dear friend, a faithful teacher, a wonderful man, and a servant of God. Um, we'd like to start this morning with first left first. Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray continuously, give thanks in all circumstances. So we pray frequently in this church because we have so much to be grateful for and thankful for. So please, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning humbly and with an open heart ready to receive your word. So many prayer requests, so many things to be thankful for, so much that we enjoy in this country, and so much grace that has been given to us by you through your Son. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for continuing to protect us, protect our freedom to worship. Father, we just ask that you will continue to put your arms around each one of us individually and the Christian nation corporately. Thank you for all that you do in Christ's name. Amen. So we will start, can we start with some, do we have a song we're going to start with, or are we not doing a song this morning? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. A song. I should have asked you before I got on the camera, I guess, right? <laughs> oh, uh, you always sing, right? Yeah, Absolutely. Okay. We're always ready to do some singing. Right, I'm going to uh, turn this mic off for a minute, and then we're going to sing a song. Join us in uh, hymn 373, hymn number 373. Simple to sing, take my life and let it be. Make sure I've got the right music queued up here. Take my life and let it be. Okay. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my hand. Let them move at the impulse of thy love, at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my Fantastic. Thank you for that. I will uh, make sure next week that uh, I'll let you know. <laughs> Very good. Um, prayer request this morning. So if you all are not on the Spring Valley Bible Church distribution list, emails come out every week, uh, please let Leslie know and uh, she can get you on that distribution list. <clears throat> we have a, a fairly long, you know, for a small church, we have a lot of people we pray for, which is a, just a blessing, an amazing thing. So a couple of uh, things I'd like to call out. First of all, um, we already mentioned Herman and Judith. Please continue to be in prayer for them. Judith in, uh, in, in strength and peace and comfort in all that she's doing to help Pastor Maddox and uh, for his recovery uh, and his continuous joy even in the tribulation. Uh, Fassel and Carrie, uh, would like to pray for Fassel and Carrie. 
Grace Bible Church Pakistan is uh, an amazing ministry where they go into uh, Pakistan and minister to a nation, a nation of 98% Muslim. And so let's please be in prayer for that. Also for their, uh, they are attempting to and will, through the grace of God, uh, adopt a couple of kids. One they've already adopted, and they need to figure out if they can get him back here to the U.S. And the other one, um, what's her name? Chris? Little Carrie. Little Carrie. Yeah, makes sense. Little Carrie. Uh, they are trying to go through the uh, process of adoption there. If you're interested in, in donating to that cause, uh, please go to Grace Bible Church Pakistan, and there's some information there with regards to how you could uh, contribute. They have to raise about $25,000. I think they're at sixteen or $17,000 now. So it's an expensive process. Uh, the Risley family, uh, the missionaries in Mexico, please be in prayer for Pat and uh, Bill Risley. Uh, a lot going on there. What an amazing uh, missionary group. Three generations of missionaries down in Mexico. Um, incredible. Uh, please be in prayer for our young people. Uh, we have a lot of, of young people that have gone back to college now, and they are trying to figure out um, how to stay healthy, how to stay in school, how to get the job done, uh, and uh, please be in prayer for all of them. Be in prayer not only that they stay safe and that they can do well in their school and, and stay focused, but that they can be a light, a light in these uh, established um, colleges that, that seem to be challenging everything that is established um, to include the Word of God. So please uh, be in prayer for that. Uh, our young people with our youth groups and our youth ministry, uh, looking forward to uh, getting ready to do a planning session with our uh, youth ministry board and really see what we're going to look towards, what God is going to be doing this next year within the youth ministry. So excited to start that as well. Military, our police and firemen, we support our military and uh, we support our police first responders, all those that are in harm's way with the, not only COVID, but that secure our freedom uh, through through our police and law enforcement and our military. So any other prayer requests? I have one more. Uh, my boss is, um, his father he has gone into the hospital with COVID and is in the emergency room and they are trying to figure out what to do there. So please be in prayer for my my boss, his name is Ernest. Uh, he's down in Corpus Christi with his dad, and uh, just peace and and comfort for, and healing for his dad, but also that I might have the opportunity to continue to talk to him about uh, about Christ as a savior. So that would be my prayer there. And, you know, yeah, uh, Debbie will be traveling to and from Oklahoma this week for business. So okay. safe travel while on the road. Awesome, safe travels for Debbie. Any other prayer requests? Awesome. We bring these things before the Lord, the uh, the throne of grace, and uh, we, we put our faith in the fact that he's going to play the, all of these prayer requests out exactly the way he wants to. The cool part is, is that no prayer will ever go unanswered. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is, hey, just wait. So as we look to the Lord, uh, as these things play out, uh, we will put our faith that he has the perfect plan. Uh, but we will continuously pray for uh, for these prayer requests and and this uh, whole list. Take time to to go through these, see the names, pray for these people, um, and pray for our country. The challenges that we have before us. I think things are going to get uh, increasingly crazy between now and uh, election day, and then depending on the result, I think either side of the aisle it's going to get even crazier after that. So that being said. Uh, let's pray for our country and that we will turn to the Lord for guidance. Uh, donations, um, if you are here, there's a uh, plate in the back. We're not going to pass it around, but feel free. Uh, we operate in uh, the devil's world, and the devil's world requires funds. Uh, God is always gracious and providing the funds that we need to keep the doors open, the lights on, uh, our youth ministry going. Uh, the support of the missionaries, but all of these things take money. So if you are uh, led, please feel free to give back there. Uh, if Leslie is online, I'm sure that by now in the bar next to the uh, 
the video on Facebook. You will see where you can give online. Um, if you would like to join us at future dates, uh, we are open for business. Uh, we are accepting the congregation here. Uh, we will allow you the opportunity to social distance as far as we can within the confines of, of our, our space allotted to us. Um, but we will be more than happy if you'd like to join and are not comfortable being around a big crowd to put you in the corner and, uh, and we won't make fun of you or anything, I promise. But um, masks are welcome if you so choose as well, but we would love to have you join us uh, in person. Uh, we enjoy the, uh, the communion together, which, oh, by the way, will be next week. Uh, so join us for communion. Uh, we would love to have you. The, uh, the address is on the website, which, again, springvalleybiblechurch.org. It will be in the side bar here on the side of the, uh, the video. And with that... I want to do an intro here, and then we will pray together uh, to prepare ourselves for the Word. Uh, the first, this series that I am doing right now is all focused on First Peter, and we may get into some of the, the things within uh, Second Peter. It depends on how long uh, I have to continue to teach, or how long it takes me to get through what I already have. Uh, but the, the the series is titled "The Ambassador's Handbook." We, as we talked about in the first hour, and if you didn't have a chance to to, uh, to watch it live, please feel please. I encourage you to watch the video on YouTube. That's available to us um, to set the foundation for what we're getting into with the Ambassador's Handbook. We, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, are not citizens of this world. We are citizens of heaven, and we have the opportunity, as citizens of heaven, to be a representative, an ambassador for Christ in this fallen world. This book. First Peter is written to the early Christians that were under persecution, that recognized the fact that they were not citizens of Rome, necessarily. They were not uh, citizens of this world, but they were citizens of heaven. And this was encouragement, this was direction, and this was commands of how to operate as an ambassador, the ambassador's handbook. And so I wanted to use an analogy as we get into this before, I, before we pray and actually open the, the scriptures here. Uh, if you stop and think about an ambassador, an ambassador from the United States, does anybody know, are you an ambassador from the United States? Kelly Craft is her name, the uh, UN ambassador for the United States. She's been appointed by the president of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. I kind of think of this as we do this analogy, appointed and confirmed God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. They're all involved, right? We got the, uh, everybody's involved with the, uh, the appointment of an ambassador, chosen to be an ambassador. They are chosen to represent the United States to the world. Before the ambassador is qualified to represent the U.S., they have to be qualified in knowing a lot of different things, right? You don't just pick somebody off the street who knows nothing and put them as the ambassador to the world, to the U.N., the U.S. ambassador. They have to understand what they are representing, right? Probably should know something about the Constitution of the United States. Probably should know something about the foundation of the United States. They have to understand where they come from, who they are representing, the people of the United States. And in order to do a good job, they probably should know some basic, we'll call them doctrines, they should understand some basic doctrines of what they're representing in the United States. Foreign policy, position on human rights, what we believe to be true, how we will respond. They're representing the policies of the United States, the policies of the president. And this is true for all presidents. So anybody out there who all of a sudden went, oh, that, no, it's all presidents, whoever is in, in control at that particular time. Right, And they have to understand the rights and privileges that American citizens have. In order to do a good job, they need to understand these things. Constitution, foreign policy, position on human rights. The responsibilities of the ambassador are to re represent the U.S., represent the policies of the president, the policies and laws of our land, and to stand firm, resolved in representing the best interest of the United States. The ambassador should call out those countries that don't follow basic human principles, and they should stand firm when attacks come their way. It is the job of the ambassador to demonstrate love for the citizens of her country and represent the beauty of this country to the world. 
It is the role of the U.S. ambassador to shine the light of freedom and influence the world towards our God. That's the role. That's what we do. That's an ambassador. With our citizenship being uh, the born again believer being in heaven, we are ambassadors to the world. The whole Bible, the Word of God, is what we need to continue to grow into in order to do a good job in this position. The epistles written, the epistles, first and second Peter, written by Peter, are a great handbook to get us started and a reminder to those of us who have gotten caught up in being part of this world. Let us pray together. And the purpose of this prayer is to check your faith orientation. Are you putting aside the distractions of the world and placing your faith in this Holy Spirit to be the teacher today? I'm not the teacher. What comes out of my mouth, I'm praying, is the words of the Spirit. What is ingested and, and turned into food for us to be able to move forward, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's take a minute to, to check ourselves. Heavenly Father, we spent a minute this morning before we get started in opening your word, to think about whether or not we are putting our trust in you. Are we defaulting to our positions, to our feelings, to our thoughts? Or are we looking to you to make the clear illumination of your word understood by us so that we may apply it to our lives? Father, we pray that, our, that the Holy Spirit will just come down this morning and be a part of each one of us in the learning and opening and studying of your word. In Christ's name, amen. So, um, I'm going to find my notes here real quick. We covered a bunch this morning, and we didn't cover a bunch this morning. I thought we were going to cover a bunch more. Okay. It's, uh, it's not mine, it's the Lord's. So, I wanted to talk for a second, um, do a quick review of a couple of things. As we open the word, uh, I want to, two points I want to talk to you in, uh, in review from this morning. As we open the Bible, this is the word of God. It is written by Peter, but it's done through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we have to make sure that as we open the word, as we go through this series, I'm going to call out some points of truth that are, that we, some of us may or may not agree with. I'm teaching the Word of God. I'm teaching what it says in the, as, you know, from the power of the Spirit as illuminated through the Word so that you can see what it says. We all have to make our decisions as to whether or not we're going to believe it. And so as we go through these things, the thing we're going to need to make sure we're aware of is once we decide whether we're going to believe it, then we got to do something about it. We have to take those things that God has made real to us, true to us, and we need to do something about it. And we do that through faith, through the power of the Spirit. And so the first period, the first part of the uh, series this morning, uh, we really spoke about uh, a couple of things. Our position as being born again, new birth. What are those things that we have as a foundation of us being an ambassador for Christ? We have to know who we are. We have to know who we are in Christ, and that is our position in Christ. We have to understand that we are translated out of the darkness of sin into the light. We have to understand that we are crucified, buried, and resurrected with Christ. That's who we are. We are raised to walk in a newness of life. We're seated at the right hand of, of the Father with Christ in our position. We are citizens of heaven we are forgiven of all of our trespasses. We need to look for continual sanctification through our checking of our faith. And we are justified and blessed with every spiritual blessing. That's who we are. So as we decide to move forward and, and put our faith in Christ and put our faith in the Holy Spirit as ambassadors, we need to constantly to focus our foundation of what we know to be true on these things. That's who we are. As an ambassador to the UN, she needs to know who she is. As Christians in this world, we need to know who we are. And so I'll pick it up from there. So um, right now we were finishing up verses, uh, we've read verses 1 through 9, and uh, we will be picking it up here in a second. I'm finishing up verses uh, 3 through 9. So it says, blessed 
Be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sorry, this is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because of his, because of his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperish that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. You are being guarded by God's power through faith for a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. You rejoiced in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials. So that the proven character of your faith, which is more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. So a living hope. Our hope is in the living, resurrected Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are in eternity no matter what happens on earth. We live, we should be living our lives in the reflection of who we are in Christ, in the fact that that's our living hope. Our hope is alive. Jesus Christ is alive. He's not a dead pagan god. He's not a gold calf. He's not a uh, somebody who died years ago. He was he was crucified, he was buried, he was resurrected, and he's alive with our Father. And when we keep that in our mind, we should have a ton of confidence in being able to go out into the world and express who he is. He's alive. We also have a future inheritance. What is this inheritance? It's eternal life. We have the opportunity to share the glory of Christ eternally, and that's our foundation. We have a relationship with God forever, the God of the universe, the creator of all things. And he will, Jesus Christ, will be revealed in the end times. And we know that, and that's where we focus our attention. If we live our lives totally focused on today, if we live our lives on what's going on in today's world, Man, talk about confusion and anxiety and stress. But we don't live our lives that way. As a Christian, as a follower of Christ, as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope is in the coming of the resurrected Christ, our Savior, the living Christ. Will there be trials? Absolutely. Our entire focus last year on um, at camp, which was Fantastic. John 16, 33. If you'll turn to John 16, 33 with me, I think it's worth reading. Because this is what we were teaching our young people last year. And oh, by the way, all of us as we were studying and getting ready to teach. It's not just the young people that are taught in this. But if you look at John 16, 33, and I won't put my, my uh, campers and staff on, on the uh, hot seat to have them recite it. But we will, uh, John 16, 33. I have told you these things, all of these things from the Upper Room Discourse, so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. There will be trials for a little while. If we find ourselves over a long period of time never having any trials, never having any challenges, nothing is going on in our lives, probably should stop for a minute and check whether or not we are actually being ambassadors, whether or not we are shining the light. Because, man, the world doesn't like the light. What's the light do? It shines a light on all the things that are wrong. That's what light does. It makes all the things that we hide in the darkness revealed. So people don't like the light. Those that do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ do not like the light, but the conviction of the Spirit will get them there. And so there's two types of suffering that we all need to be aware of. There's discipline, which if you have children or if you have a parent, which we all do, so all of us are in this, we can understand discipline. The, the painful things that we get to go through when we've done wrong in order to correct those things to put us back on the right path. 
And guys, our Lord is a just Lord. And he is a Lord that loves us. And discipline is part of loving us. Just like discipline is part of loving your kids. So discipline is due to, you know, discipline due to turning away from God designed to convict us to turn back to him. That's discipline. That's the whole design of discipline. So what does that mean for us? We need to recognize when we're being disciplined, right, the trials of discipline, and we need to get back in line. We need to understand and get back to being filled with the Spirit, spirit obedient through faith. And then there's blessing, the testing of our faith that strengthens our endurance of faith and glorifies the Lord. The world, the angel, and the world and the angels are watching. How will we respond? Discipline brings the individual back to the Spirit of God so that they can shine the light. Trials and tribulations that are done through, uh, that are designed for blessing, allow us to shine the light to the world. Stand in the trials and tribulations and proclaim your faith and show the joy and light of the, of the Lord and you will see people turn to the Lord. That's the point. So these things are designed for the expansion of our faith. Faith is personal confidence in God. It implies that the individual has come to know God and has come to a degree of real experience with him. That's faith. There's got to be some sort of real experience in faith in order for us to, for our faith to be challenged, right? Or for our faith to grow. As we are tried, as tribulations happen, as we recognize that we are lost, that's real experience. That's things that we really go through, and that strengthens our faith towards the Lord. Not all men have, but all not all men have faith. Jesus Christ is the founder and perfecter of our faith. The Spirit is the convictor. But God gives us the faith. They have the opportunity for faith. And faith, foundational to our faith, is the knowing of God. Foundational to the faith is knowing God. Who He is, what He is, what He has done for us. So this is all with regards to who we are and what our foundation is in being an ambassador. We need to understand that the expansion of our faith, the foundation of our faith is knowing God. The Spirit of God convicts the unbeliever to a saving faith. The Spirit of God convicts the believer to a sanctifying faith. And God wants our total under unconditional faith. One of the biggest challenges that we all have is, hey, God, you can have this part of, of my life. You can control these. I trust you in all of these things. These are the things that I'll turn these over to you. God doesn't want part of our life. God wants all of our life. He wants everything from us. You know, um, sometimes I, I hear about, oh, you don't want to be one of those Jesus freaks. Why not? Why not? God wants all of our faith. Put it all in there. When people ask you where your foundation comes from, it's from Jesus. How did you get so strong from God? How did you get so this from God? Everything came from him. All spiritual blessings, all blessings came from God. Right, even your guns, right? Even the guns, they came from God. And so it's okay to be a Jesus freak. Not being a Jesus freak is just being aligned with the world. Nobody wants to be one of those Jesus freaks. Our faith, God wants everything, unconditional, all in, turn it over to me, trust me. And so... As we read verse um, 8 and 9 here, it says, let me find my spot. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe him and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy because you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Here's the pinnacle of the believer's joy. Talked about it this morning. Picture Peter as he's speaking of his, of our Savior. Picture the enthusiasm. Picture the relationship. This is his friend. This is his Savior. This is the person that he followed around for the three years of his life. This is the person that reached out to him when he denied Christ and came and said, I will build my church upon your rock. He is, think of, of the relationship and the love that Peter has, and he's expressing this 
to his followers, to Peter's, the people that he is discipling and the people that he is, is teaching. And he said, picture this, and this is not just a fact of state of gospels, excuse me. This is not just a statement of factual doctrine for people, for Peter. This is a personal, loving, emotional statement. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him and you rejoice. Inexpressible and glorious joy. You may not see him now, but I did. There is an empirical evidence. There is not empirical evidence of Jesus, but we believe him through faith. Peter saw him. Peter watched him. Peter loved him. Believe in him. Love him as I love him. That's what Peter is saying here. We, if you don't know, we all should know that Peter went on to be martyred for Christ. He laid it all out there. He turned it all over to Christ. That's what he's proclaiming here. Is I love him. You should love him. How do we love him? Through getting to know him. Study of the word of God. Right? God has revealed himself to us through this book. Spending time with him in prayer. Knowing that your eternal salvation is already yours. It's set aside. These are the going through doctrine. I, I sometimes hear the, the, the oh that stuff is old or that's boring. That's understanding the doctrines of the Bible are foundational to understanding God. He's revealed himself to us through the word of God. We need to be filled with an incomprehensible joy from the filling of the Spirit. We need to spend time with him. We get to know him. We get to understand him. It's really hard to put our trust in something that we don't know or understand. You know, I mean, it's hard. In fact, if you don't know or understand something, it's almost impossible. What incredible encouragement this should be to all of us, right? The inexpressible and glorious joy because you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. That's what we're achieving through our salvation is an eternal inheritance. This is who we are. This is, the found, this is foundational to us being able to be an ambassador, to go out into the world, is understanding who we are. We are saved. We are justified. We are filled with the Spirit. We have the power of the Spirit. We are in Christ we should be filled with an incomprehensible joy. Joy is from the filling of the Spirit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. A total occupation with Christ results in an incomprehensible joy. This should be encouragement for what Christ did for us, who we are in Him, all that we have in Him. These things are eternal and cannot be taken away. We spend so much time trying to pile up all the things of this world. No, mortality rate still 100%. Nobody gets out of here with all the things they have. It all goes away. Those things that are eternal are the things that we need to focus on. Take your eyes off of the world and put them onto Christ. The world will have us chase all kinds of good stuff. But only God will have us follow the things that are good in his eyes. So continuing to move on, this is the foundation for who we are. In verses 1 through tw uh, 10 through 12, concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that would come to you searched and carefully investigated. They inquired into what time or what circumstance the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating when he testified in advance to the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. These things have now been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Angels long to, camp, long to catch a glimpse. So as, as we read this, I'm trying to put it back into context, the majority of the, the, the recipients of these epistles were, were former Jews. There were Gentiles in this congregation as well. But the majority of these were Jews. And these believers were very familiar with the writings of the prophets. The scriptures. They knew the Old Testament, right? They were raised. Uh, they were raised in the Jewish faith. They understood the Old Testament. They they knew the scriptures. 
And so the, this understanding of the scriptures was reinforcement of the truth of the living hope in Christ. They can see that the Spirit revealed the persecution of Christ and the ultimate glory in the resurrection. And that's in Isaiah 53. We talk about it all the time. We've read it many a times. Prophet Isaiah, he told us what was going to happen with Christ. These, these folks, these Jews that are now believers, they understood and can see that, that what God is saying is true. They believe it in faith. But they see the scriptures and the, the result in Christ. Isaiah 53, that Christ would be put on the, the cross and crushed for the sins and the iniquities of us all. And they can see these things, right? They, they understood them and they, and they can see that they happened. And this is encouragement to each one of us that the word of God is true and that this is from God. They too will be prosec- uh, persecuted, but they will live in glory with Christ. If you can see that Jesus Christ, that the prophets, the scriptures... Um, that were revealed by the prophets, prophesied the truth of Christ coming and what happened. And now the the, uh, the scriptures say, "Hey, you by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved, and you will have an etern- you have an eternal inheritance, and you have uh, these these things that are true in your soul, and that you will be live in glory with Christ." How much encouragement is that to know? Hey, what they said before is true, and what they say now is true. That's our foundation. But we have to know the Word. We have to understand something about this in order for any of it to be revealed or to be illuminated to us. Knowledge of the Scriptures supports and encourages our faith. When the truth of God's Word plays out in our lives, it becomes easier to place our trust in Him. Have you ever been in prayer for something? And just prayed and prayed and prayed. I hope this is true for everybody. Please don't raise your hands. But and just prayed and prayed and prayed. And then you saw the truth of God's word, the truth and faithfulness of that he hears our prayers play out in your life. Doesn't that encourage you to truth? Doesn't that encourage you to, to pray? Doesn't that encourage you to, to want to dive deeper into this and get to know this faithful God of ours? Our faith is not based on the writings of men, but on the Spirit-revealed Word of God. And I say that and make this point. There are a ton of things, books, that have been written that are man's recommendations, man's feelings, man's interpretations that are not from the Scriptures. And we will run around all day long, oh, isn't that wonderful, isn't that wonderful? No, God gave us what he wants us to know. Open the word of God, and that's where we find our source. If we're holding up this book and leaving this book closed, we're missing the point. Our faith is not based on the writings of men, but based on the spirit-revealed word of God. The goal is not just the intake of doctrine, though. 20 hours a day, every day, for the entire life, and you never take any of this and do anything with it, we've missed the point. This is the Word of God. This is designed to change our lives, to move us forward the way God wants us to move and do the things that God wants us to do through His power. The goal is not just the intake of doctrine. The goal is living our life, walking in the plan of God through faith. God gave us the Scriptures so that we know how to walk. In the Old Testament, in the dispensation of Israel, the Spirit of God would talk to us. To talk to the believers, talk to those who, who place their faith. And there were particular believers that he gave the word to. In the New Testament, in the mystery, God has written his entire canon. He has given us his word and said, here, this is it. I'm giving it, giving it to you. This is what I want you to know. This is what I need you to know. I don't need you to know a whole lot more. Just go find this. And we can spend a lifetime studying it, but we have to spend time. God gave us his word to reinforce and, re- and encourage our faith. God gave us his word to reveal himself to us. God gave us the word so that we could understand the world from his perspective. You know, we need to stop trying to understand the world from our perspective. We will not understand it. Or if we do, we will understand it from the world's perspective. There's a God-oriented view of the world, and there's a world-oriented view of the world. And when you spend time in the scriptures, 
and an encouragement to all of us, including myself, and spend time in the scriptures, the revelation of the God view of the world becomes real clear. And it's real easy to understand when we have gotten out of whack because the world's view is the world's view. It's the devil's view. The mystery. The mystery is the Christian in the church age. The scriptures of the Old Testament did not talk about the church age. It was a total mystery. They did not know it was coming. They did not understand that this was going to happen. And then God says, you have rejected me, Israel. I am faithful and will always, you will always be my people and I will deliver on my promises. But here, here is a new creature that will be coming in as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ in the church age. I will reveal my entire word to him and I will fill them with the spirit. That's who we are. And that's how we get to live our life. The mystery is uh, the Christian in the church age, the, even the angels wanted to know what's going on. The angels are watching, supernatural creatures that watch us. We say, hey, how is this going to play out? Who are these people? Who are these children of God? 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved the future to a future inheritance is the power of God. When we dig into this and we start representing our Lord and Savior and the Word of God to the world as ambassadors from heaven, we're going to be thought fools. You might as well plan on it. If you haven't had that experience, go into school and spend a little time talking to them about creationism. Spend the day talking to all of your friends about creationism and see how much of a fool they think you are. I'll make a, a, a plug again from this morning. Genesis, The Lost Paradise, great movie. Uh, it's based on, on Genesis, and it refutes a lot of the uh, evolutionary concepts. It refutes them not only through the Bible, but it refutes them through science, uh, which is pretty cool. For the record, it takes every bit as much faith to believe in evolution, in fact, more than it does to believe in creation. Yes, sir. Lost paradise. Lost paradise lost. Paradise lost. Genesis paradise lost. It's a great movie. It costs you a couple bucks on your uh, uh, subscription streaming subscription, but it's a great movie, and it really is encouraging to those of you who want to walk into a uh, a room full of uh, evolutionists and explain to them creationism. Uh, it's pretty. It, it's ba It's it's based in truth, and uh, you will be declared a fool. Promise, because the world does not want to have anything to do with it. The world doesn't want to have anything to do with creation and the creation of the world by God, because the world doesn't want to have anything to do with God. If we can remove creationism from the Bible, if we can remove creationism from our society, then we can remove God. Because as soon as as soon as all of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and stand up and say this is truth start modifying our beliefs in creationism and merging them with evolution, then all those watching get to go, it's all a lie. Because if that's a lie, if that's not true, how is any of it true? Be real careful about understanding and merging evolution and creation. That is totally a side note, but as, a, uh, as an ambassador, you need to know certain things, right? Now that's one that you should know. So, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are uh, perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So, moving on to verse 13 through 16, 1 Peter chapter 1, 13 through 16. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Wow. That in and of itself, y'all, we could spend a whole lot of time on. We'll continue, though. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So it says, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, our future inheritance. When Jesus Christ returns, y'all, 
we will be with him. We will be in glory with him. That's our inheritance. We focus on this world. Jesus is going to turn things upside down in this world. We get to be with our glorified Savior, Jesus Christ, when he returns. Fix that in your mind. Fix your hope completely. This is not a well kind to think about it kind of stuff. This is a command to fix your hope completely. With your minds ready for action, sober-minded, set your hope. How do we do that? The occasional, hmm, I'll go to church. I prayed once. I'm fixing my hope. I got my hope fixed on. This is continuous. I like this Jesus stuff, but I don't want people to think I'm some sort of a freak. Kind of. We can't, vote, we can't fix our hope on something with just little grabs at. I, I think of hanging from a tree. If we just kind of kind of kind of hang on, you're gonna fall. Fix your hope, grab a hold of it with both hands and just don't let go. Keep sober in your spirit. Do not allow anything but your focus on the Lord to control your thinking. This is hard because the world is after us all the time. Everything we see on TV, everything we, we need to stay focused on Christ. It's hard to do because the world wants every minute of our attention, every bit as much as Christ wants every minute of our attention. Prepare your minds for action. So how do we stay focused? How do we resolve our hope? How do we, how do we stay you know, completely focused? We need to prepare our minds for action. And I want to talk, this is where I'll end this afternoon, I mean this morning, uh, but I want to talk to you all about preparing your minds for action. There are three types of, of people, three types of people in this world. There's the natural man, right? They have a body and they have a soul. They're born, they're here, and woman. I'll just caveat this whole thing. When I say man, I'm talking about mankind until we get to wives and husbands. But there's the natural man, right? The body and the soul, they're spiritually dead. They do not have a spirit. They will not be able to understand spiritual things. They're unable to discern the spiritual, and they're living under the penalty of sin. They're living under the penalty of sin. They don't have salvation. There's nothing in them. If, if you do not have the Spirit of God in you, you can't discern spiritual. But the Spirit of God can influence them to salvation. The Spirit of God will convict the natural man to salvation. But as we talked about earlier, there is the institution of free will. It's the divine institution. God doesn't make them do it. But God will present and convict and continue to, to uh, challenge them to salvation. That's the natural man. That's how we are all born. Once we are saved, well, let me back up for a second. We'll talk about the carnal man. And that's we. The carnal man is relating to the phys physical. Carnal is related to the physical. The carnal man is that a believer who's believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is saved forever, but has is focused on the world. Right? They're indwelt by the Spirit of God fully. We never lose that. That is a, a gift of salvation. We're able to discern the spiritual because of the Spirit of God living in us, but we live in sin. We're living in sin, which is, oh, by the way, anything that's not done in faith. We can be running around all day long and doing all the good works that everybody from the world looks at and goes, oh, my gosh, they are amazing. They are fantastic. They are so wonderful. But if it's not being done in faith, if it's not being done in the leading of the Spirit, if it's not being done in the fact that God said, hey, I want you to go do this, then it's carnal. It's all focused on the physical. It's all focused on yourself. So we can live in sin, anything not done in faith, and still be saved. But we're living under the power of sin. If you are carnal, you're living under the power of sin. And what we look like as an ambassador is we look exactly like everybody else in the world. We don't shine the light. If we look around the world and we look around and 
everything we do aligns with everything everybody else does, I can tell you that you're missing the Spirit of God. Because we are not here to look like everybody else. We are not here to jump on every cause of everybody else. We are not here to fix the problems of everybody else. We are here to represent Christ. And we're going to talk, before you see anybody takes that out of context, there are things that Christ and that God will, and the Spirit will lead us to do that it may be a cause. It may be something that we need to be involved with because out of our love as a Christian, out of our love and unity of the church, we may be called to be involved in things. But if it's the cause that we are, 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 uh, are representing, that's not who we are in Christ. That's carnal. Even if it's wonderful in the world's view, it's carnal. It's not representing Christ. And then there's the spiritual man or person. They're saved. They're indwelt by the Spirit. They can and are discerning the spiritual. And they're living in the power of the Spirit through faith. Colossians 2.6 Just as you were saved, also walk in faith. And their mind is prepared for action. So what does this verse mean when it says prepare your mind for action? Put yourself in the Spirit of God, in the power of the Spirit, and get ready for the challenge. It's coming. And we do that through the intake of, of the Word of God, and we do that through believing those things through faith and applying those things to our life. That's the spiritual believer. The spiritual man. And y'all, every single one of us will find ourselves at times under temptation and falling to sin. So how do we go from being carnal to spiritual? For anybody on this video or anybody who's watching who is not who does not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this doesn't matter to you. The only things that matter to you is do you believe in the work of Christ on the cross and do you believe he died was buried, and was resurrected for you. If you believe that, and that is truth to you in your soul, then you are a believer, and the Spirit of God is in you, and you can discern these things. If you don't, then let's have more conversations about that, because that's the point. For those of you who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is to us. This is from 1 Peter to each one of us as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we move to prepare our minds if we are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's who this is written to, how do we prepare our minds in order for action? First of all, we have to identify the issue. The Alcoholics Anonymous, right? You got to admit the fact that you're an alcoholic in order to be to to be able to go through the process. If if we cannot identify the fact that we are carnal that we are not following the Spirit, if we look around and we're doing everything like everybody else, if we look around and the things of the Word of God are in our minds and we know that they're true and we're ignoring them, if we're looking around and we're doing everything that's all focused on us, we're carnal. We just are. And every one of us is carnal at times. The question is, is it for this much time or is it for this much time? That's the challenge. And so in order to prepare our minds, we have to recognize the fact that we are operating in sin, outside of faith. And then we have to identify what is preventing us from that. Is it our decisions to the way we live our life? Is it our own internal focus? Is it our own arrogance? Is it our own pride? Those things we have to understand. In order for us to turn away from those things and turn back to faith, we need to understand what it is that's causing us to walk away from it. Is it, the, is it the particular moment? Is it fear? Is it stress? Is it anxiety? Is it some sort of a sin pattern? Is it something that, hey, we just don't want to give up? We just don't want to give up. Is it overt? Is it internal? Is it an attitude? Is it anger? Is it envy? Is it poor me? Oh, I'm focused on me. What is it that's preventing us from turning to the Lord and placing our faith in Him. And then we need to remove it. And this is done by placing our faith. And it's not the, about the act of confession. And I know many of you in here understand this. As I said earlier, 
My prayer is that this will go out to a larger audience that, oh, by the way, maybe a significant number of our, our youth, and I want to make sure that this is fully understood and known. <clears throat> it's not about the act of confession, but if we don't take the time to identify that we have sinned and we are not willing to address the fact that we have sinned and we've resulted in a breakdown of our faith, how will we realize that we aren't trusting the Spirit? If we don't spend any time checking ourselves, how will we ever know? Confession doesn't get us there, but we got to go through the process of understanding where we broke down in order to get us there. And then we need to remove it. This can look different for everyone. God has paid the penalty for all of our sins, so guilt is an expression of not trusting that God took care of our sin. God doesn't ask for our guilt. Guilt is actually a sin, right? So when we say remove it, I'm not talking about go feel guilty about it. Can you be in a conversation with God and not uh, and be sorry for not trusting him? I think so. But that doesn't mean you have, you're guilty. That doesn't mean you feel guilty. And when I have a conversation with my wife, if we're in a disagreement and I feel like I hurt my wife in some way, will I apologize and say, honey, I'm sorry? Sure. Is it guilt? If if I'm feel if, if that's where I am, if I hurt my wife, and, and it's I don't think it's wrong to apologize, if I continue to feel guilty and mope and whine, and after that, um, after she's forgiven me, then I'm not recognizing the forgiveness. Same thing with God. Why, why would it be wrong to recognize we have an issue? Say, God, I'm sorry about that. He's our friend. He's our Savior. He's our God. There's nothing wrong with that conversation. But we need to put our faith back in the fact that he has forgiven us of those things. He is faithful. It's not about what we do or how we feel. It's about his faithfulness. And so doing something to gain the forgiveness of God in and of itself is sin. Going to God and telling him, oh, by the way, I will feel guilty. I'll never do this again. I'm so sorry. I'll do 100 penance. I'll give twice as much to the church. All of these things that we feel that we need to do in order to get his forgiveness, that is sin. Anything not done in faith is sin. But the fact of the matter is, walking into God and saying, I'm sorry, I've done this, and I'm here to place my faith back in you. To me, confession, repentance, filled with the Spirit. God says you are forgiven. Trust me. So here's the restoration part. Until we go back to faith, we are not restored. Our minds are not prepared for action until we go back to faith. That's the restoration. That's the part where God says, hey, trust me, I got it under control. And when we're trusting him, then our minds are prepared for action. We can't identify the breakdown of faith. Keep doing it, acting, thinking exactly the same way, and then expect that we are back to faith. That doesn't make any sense at all. It doesn't make any sense. We can't be in faith and turn around and go do exactly what we're always doing and be in faith and not. Now, are we sinners? Absolutely. Could we have another breakdown after we turned away? Absolutely. We are all imperfect and God's grace is endless. But it is very clear that the intent is not to continue to sin and is not that we should continue to sin so that grace can abound. God knows our heart. He knows our intentions. How do we know our mind is prepared for action? We know this because we're filled with the Spirit when the fruit of the Spirit is present in our life. I'll say this in closing. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. How do we know our minds are prepared for action? Because the fruit of the Spirit will be demonstrated through us to our brothers and sisters in Christ, to the world, and everybody we come in contact with. That's how we know we're filled with the Spirit. That's how we know that our minds are prepared for action. That's how we know we're a spiritual believer. At that point, we can study the Word of God and intake the Word of God and trust that He will teach us the Word. And we can discern spiritual things and we can understand what God wants us to do when we are trusting the Word of God. The fruit of the Spirit should be evident in every one of us. 
Y'all, if we're out there saving the world through hate and anger and and envy and jealousy, and we are chasing all the things of the world, the fruit of the Spirit is not being demonstrated. And if the fruit of the the Spirit is not being demonstrated, we are not prepared for action. Test yourselves. Test yourselves every day. Test yourselves in every interaction that we have with another believer, especially another believer. Another believer who's out making a fool of themselves for the Word of God? Restore gently. Love them. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We restore them gently. We don't malign and envy. The world is watching. The angels are watching. The spirits uh, are watching us from the standpoint of how are we going to interact with each other? How are we going to glorify our God? How are we going to represent our Savior? We are being watched all the time. When we walk into a conversation with another believer and we tear them down, What kind of an ambassador are we? It's kind of like the ambassador of the UN standing up before the UN and tearing down representatives of our nation. It's wrong. It's wrong. And that's not showing the love of Christ. With that, I will close. We will pick this up next week. Uh, We will be talking about, do not conform to the lusts of the world, but as as obedient children, be holy. That's where we will focus our time next week. Thank you for your attention. I hope that, uh, that the Holy Spirit will just take these things and, uh, and make them real in your life. It's the truth. Next week, I have that feeling we're going to be talking about some things that uh, we're going to have to have some decision points around. Do we believe it or do we not? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together this morning. I thank you for the opportunity to, to stand before this congregation and uh, honored and humbled. And Father, I thank you for uh, you providing the words, even the ones that I stumbled over. Father, I just pray that uh, that your spirit will take these things and they'll make them true to each one of us, however they are true in our lives, however they are impacting to our lives. That's your job. That's the spirit's job. We thank you for the blessing of eternal salvation. We thank you for the foundation of who we are through our new birth. And we ask, ask, Father, that you help us through this week, prepare our mind for action, and place our hope in you. In Christ's name, amen.